Hi, glad to see you're back. This is video two on data types. And in this video, we're gonna be discussing structs, floats, and doubles. Okay, we're gonna start with structures. And as you might already know, they look like this, and it allows you to have a bunch of related data types together. And in this example, we have two cars, X and Y, and we have an int, which is Z. So what do you think the size of the structure will be? So we know that on X86, the size of car is one byte, and the size of int is four bytes, since we have two cars, we'll multiply it by two. And after adding it up, it seems like the size of the structure will be six bytes. Or is it? To understand, you'll have to learn about alignment requirements. When your code is compiled, the compiler optimizes the code to make memory access as fast and efficient as possible for the CPU. Alignment requirements and constraints are some soft rules which makes access as fast and efficient as possible by making sure certain data types are only allowed to be allocated at certain addresses. And this will be more clear when we look at examples. So first we have the car data type, which has no alignment requirements, meaning that accessing it doesn't make much of a difference wherever you put it in memory. Every other data type though has an alignment requirement. Today's video was sponsored by Malcor.io. Scanning files for unknown threats has become essential, yet the steps to accomplish this remains complex and demanding of resources. Malcor provides a new approach to malware analysis. It was designed to automate this process and all of it can be done online within a sandbox which is able to process samples within seconds. Malcor hunting allows users to look for threat intel. Users will be able to hunt by providing the IP address or Yara rule. Malcor also provides a number of scan options to run on uploaded files. Standard scans include the ability to check for file similarities using code reuse, there's an option to analyze domains, and you can also perform analysis on an executable. Pro scans allow you to perform a binary diff onto binary files, and there's also an option that gives you access to Malcor's threat feed and allows you to gather data from it. But those are only some of the options, there are many more that you can choose from to fit your needs. Malcor offers affordable account options for you to choose from that would best cater to you. Different tiers gives you different file upload allowances, hunts, and scans. But you can start by signing up for a free account today at malcore.io. So we're going to start with integers. We know that integers come in three sizes. We have a short, which is 16 bits, int, which is 32 bits, and long, which is 64 bits on a 64-bit system. That makes a short to be two bytes, and its alignment requirement is that it should be allocated at a memory address that is divisible by two. The following addresses, all of which are completely divisible by two, are examples of addresses that follow the alignment requirement for short. Next, we have integers. It's four bytes in size, and its alignment requirement is for the address where it's allocated to be divisible by four. And again, we have some addresses as examples where they're all divisible by four. Similarly, the same applies for longs, which are eight bytes in size, and the addresses where they must be allocated should be divisible by eight, as shown here. Now we're back to our main example of the foo struct. Since we know that X and Y are cars, they can be allocated at any arbitrary address. So if the struct is allocated at the address X a thousand, X can be at a thousand, Y will be at a thousand and one. But what about Z? Since it can't be allocated at a thousand and two or a thousand and three because they're not divisible by four which is the alignment requirement for the int data type, the nearest place where it can be allocated is obviously 1004, which satisfies the requirement. But you may be wondering what happens to those two bytes in between? Will they be zeroed? Well, that depends on the compiler because the C standards don't require that gap to store zeros. Since we have two cars of one byte each and one int of four bytes, that makes six bytes. But since we have a two byte gap in between due to the alignment requirements of the int data type, the total size of this struct is eight bytes. Now we're gonna look at another example to understand and another rule of alignment. We have another structure and here we have a car X in Z and car Y. Since X is a car, it can be placed anywhere and we're gonna choose the address hex a thousand. And since Z is an integer, we can only put it at an address divisible by four, which in this case is hex a thousand four. Next, we have another car and we can just put it four bytes after Z because that's the space it'll take. Now let's calculate the size of this struct. So X is a car, but it takes one byte plus a three byte gap. So the first part of the struct takes four bytes. Then we have the part that starts from the integer Z, which is obviously four bytes long, so it takes another four bytes. And at the end, we have another car, which also takes a byte. That makes it a total of nine bytes. So the size of foo is nine bytes, right? Well, here comes another rule about alignment requirement, which says the total size of the structure needs to be a multiple of the largest alignment requirement of its members. And in our case, the largest alignment requirement in our struct is integer Z, and its alignment requirement is being divisible by four, which is not being fulfilled here because nine is not divisible by four. So if we consider this requirement, the size of this struct will be 12 bytes because the nearest multiple of four near nine 
is 12. So now we're going to look at our last example of a struct, which has another struct inside of it. The alignment of the struct will still follow the same rules since the inner struct itself is a member of the outer struct. The last rule states that the largest alignment requirement of a member of the struct will be used. So we can put X anywhere because it's a car. Y can only be put at an address divisible by eight since it's a pointer and pointers on 64 bit systems are eight bytes. And then since said is an integer, it has to be at an address which is divisible by two since shorts are two bytes. Now we can calculate by adding the gaps together to find the final size of it. First we have one byte car and then a seven byte gap due to the alignment requirement of the pointer next to it. Then we have a two byte short but the resulting size after the short is added does not satisfy the alignment requirement. Thus we add a six byte gap which makes this struct size divisible by eight by being 24 bytes in size. Okay now let's talk about floats. So a typical floating pointer or decimal point number is stored in three parts in a computer as binary. A float is usually a 32-bit representation of a decimal point number. It has three parts, one bit for the sign of the number, eight bits for the exponent, and 23 bits for the mantissa, which we will cover in a minute. Then this is fed into this formula, which is not as complicated as it might look. The first part is to find out the sign of the number. To do this, we basically raise negative one to the power of the sign bit. When it's set, we get negative one, which means the underlying number is negative in nature, and when it's clear or not set, we get a positive one. Now we're going to talk about where the mantissa and exponent come from. And to understand that, we need to learn how a decimal point number is converted into binary. The first thing we do is convert the number before the decimal point into binary directly. And since 5 is 101 in binary, we're going to convert it to that and save it. Next, we're going to take the number after the point and multiply it by 2. Then we save the number before the point, which is 1 in this case, and then take the number after the point and multiply it by 2 again, and save the number and repeat until the number after the decimal point is not 0, which we we can see we have reached in this case and we save that as the number after the point in binary. So the representation of 5.625 in binary is 101.101. .101. Now to save it into memory, we do a process known as implicit normalization. It may sound complicated, but it's easy to perform. First, we take the first bit, which is one, and put the point next to it and put the remaining numbers after it like this. We just have to multiply the shifted binary number by two raised to the number of digits before the point minus one to get to the original number. And since the number of digits in this case is 3 and 3 minus 1 is 2, we raise it by 2 which shifts the decimal point two positions left. If you're confused about how this point shift happens, remember what happens when you multiply 10 to a base 10 number with decimal points, the point gets shifted left one time. And a similar thing happens here, but because we're in base two binary, we use two instead of 10. Now this number, which is left after the one point is known as the mantissa and the power of two is known as the exponent. Now we have everything that we can put to use to represent this number as a 32 bit float. But before that, we have to convert the exponent in bias representation, which is used as an alternative alternative for representing signed and unsigned numbers together instead of two's complement. We can get the bias exponent easily by using this formula. We add the exponent to two to the power of the number of bits provided to represent the exponent minus one, which we as already discussed is eight bits and eight minus one is seven. Thus it'll be two to the seventh added to two, which is our exponent, thus resulting in a total value of 130. And the side we have is binary representation. Now we can use the formula again to convert it back. We know that the signed bit is zero so the number is positive. The mantissa is 01101, which we can put next to the point after one, and then we can multiply it by two to the power of the bias exponent and subtract the bias from it, which will be 130 minus 128, thus resulting in two. And again, when we multiply it by two raised to two, the decimal points shift back and we get the original number. So that's the magic of how floats are stored in binary on computers. And the data type double is just floats, but with more bits of space and provides more precision for repeating fractional numbers. So now onto the low level details of floats and doubles, like how does the CPU use them? Are there special registers for them or special instructions? And the answer is yes. So let's learn about them. The first type of special registers are the XMM0 to X mm15 registers which are mostly used for floats and then we have the later introduced ymm0 to ymm15 registers the main difference between these registers are their sizes each xmm register is 128 bits in size and each ymm register is 256 bits these registers usually store more than one floating point or double precision decimal point number as for special instructions the xmm registers are powered by the sse or the streaming simd extension instructions here simd stands for single instruction multiple data 
data, which is another interesting topic we can cover in a later video. And then the YMM registers are powered by the advanced vector extensions or the AVX instruction set. Now let's look at some common instructions which are used with single precision or 32-bit floats. These instructions have more or less the same effects as the normal add, sub, multiv, and move instructions, which are used for normal general purpose registers. For example, this snippet of code moves the floating point numbers from the variable A and B to the registers XMM0 and XMM1, and then adds them and the result is stored in XMM0. Similarly, the instructions for double are just different in their names and operation sizes. Otherwise, they do more or less the same things as their general purpose counterparts. And that is all for this video. Thank you again for watching and see you again next time.